I think we may be recording now. I hope we have. Well, I am glad you're here. Alec, I am glad that you are here. Um, and uh, our lesson today is on Franz Liszt. But before we actually get started, I want to do some vocabulary words. I'm going to teach you what a soundboard is. Looks like we have a few more. Yay, Rodney, welcome. A soundboard. You see two pianos here. One is an upright grand and one is a, a concert grand. And you see that steel frame in there that the strings are attached to. It has to be very strong because those strings are very tight. Behind that frame or underneath the frame in the concert grand is a piece of wood. That piece of wood is what's called the soundboard. And uh, it throws the sound out into the audience so that you can hear it. That's its job. So when we talk about a soundboard today, that's what we're talking about is a real board. The next, I want the screen to, to change. Let's see, did we miss one? No, we didn't. Okay, the next vocabulary word is an etude. Have any of you played an etude? Do you know what that is? Um, I might have played one once and I wasn't realizing it. Yes, well, they sound like songs. They're, but they're really an exercise to develop some some skill, some technique on the piano or on whatever instrument the etude is written for. This etude you see here shows 16th notes. It's played allegro, and it's to develop the, the independence of each finger in the right hand. That's an etude. It's an exercise, but it sounds like a piece of music. And there are concerts that you, you can go to and you'll hear them play an etude, and unless you knew what it was, you wouldn't know it wasn't a song. A philanthropist is a person that's wealthy that gives away, primarily money. But if someone calls you a philanthropist in your time, that means you're giving away generously of time. Because you have it, then you can give it. Listomania is another term. Long time before Beatlemania or any of the other crazy manias. Uh, Franz Liszt, you see he's got modern day sunglasses on. He was actually born in 1811. And so that was six years after Joseph Smith was born. And he was born to be a superstar, and he was a superstar. He got so for eight or nine years, people would scream and wave their arms and try to collect um, anything that Franz Liszt had ever been anywhere around. Sometimes the, they would take a piece of clothing, a shirt or a coat, and tear it into a thousand pieces, and everyone would take a small piece or pick up a hair, and this is Liszt's hair, and they would save it. And it was an intense frenzy about around his concerts. That's Listomania. It was coined by uh, the author Heinrich Heine in 1844. And now we know those terms. We're going to go into learning about Franz Liszt. He said his piano was like a frigate to a mariner, a horse to an Arab, only more. That's how important a piano was. Now, who knows what a Bosendorfer is? Because Franz Liszt preferred a Bosendorfer. Anybody ever seen one or touched one? If you look on the piano right there that Liszt is playing, you can see that he's got the audience. It's a type of piano. You are right. If you can look right here, the name is a Bosendorfer. So maybe now you can pay attention to see if you ever are able to be in the same room with a Bosendorfer. Um, yeah, let's see, let me show you something about, let me close this little thing, and this is the price range of a Bosendorfer. It's probably why you haven't ever seen one or been in the room with one. If you want a nine-foot concert grand, it's about $250,000. A cheap little upright is $63,000. That may be one reason why you've not been around a lot of Bosendorfer pianos. <laughs> okay. Now, the first section of our lesson, my mom saw one once, yes. Well, good for her. Um, if you play the piano well, you might seek for an opportunity to play a Bosendorfer and see if you notice the difference. You may have to go to a music school 
or a rich friend, or you may run across one in other ways. And if we have time, I'll tell you how we, our family, ran across a Bosendorfer piano once, just in a little, little rambler house in the middle of Warham. But we're going to talk about what Franz Liszt was given because he was given much. The first thing we have here is his family tree. I took this right off of FamilySearch.org where if you've been doing your genealogy, you've been on this very same site. You can see that he's there in the middle. He's got children and parents, grandparents and great-grandparents. And that's as far as it goes on FamilySearch. So if you knew how to do Hungarian genealogy, you wanted to help him out. There's still work to be done on Franz Liszt's line. But we're going to go, here's Franz, here's his father Adam, here's his grandfather Georg Adam, and here's his great-grandfather Sebastian Liszt. Sebastian Liszt was a migrant serf. Now in Europe in the late 1700s, middle 1700s, uh, if the serfs really had no control over their lives. They rented a little piece of ground, from a landlord, if the landlord or the culture of the kingdom changed, they thought of a new idea, what they wanted to do with their land, they would raise the rents and the serfs would have to move. And uh, that happened a lot, unfortunately, in those medieval and renaissance times. Sebastian Liszt was one of those migrating serfs. He came to the kingdom of Hungary and took up residence as a renter in a little cottage and uh, uh, he was called a cotter, and he worked the land and paid rent. But he lived to be 90 years old, and that's extraordinary for that time period. People did not live that long. That was, you know, 10, 20, 30 years longer than most people lived, and maybe more than that. So, what would Sebastian List have given to his children and grandchildren if that's all we know about him? experiences of life more than um, uh, physical gifts. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Physical gifts meaning money and houses and property. Is that what you mean? He probably would have spent and worked with his children more often. He spent time. Very, that children. could be very likely. Could be very likely. Hard work and dedication. Emmeline, that's good. Um, hard work for 90 years. A person doesn't live 90 years in the 1700s without being blessed with a healthy body. And so besides hard work, dedication, time, love, all of those are very important. We hope that's what really happened. But hard work and a healthy body, would, we, we know that, that's, that that was part of what he gave to his kids. Now, let's look at Georg Adam List, his son. Now, his son was no longer a serf that, owned, that lived in a little cottage and rented land from a landlord. He was an estate manager for several estates. And because his, he had raised his station in life, he had more time and he was able to take up, let's see, got to get it right, piano, violin, and organ. He was able to play those three instruments. Now, what would we know if that's all we know about Georg Adam List? What would we imagine he was able to give to his children and grandchildren? He probably inherited a, he a healthy body because it looks to me like he lived 89 years. And a work ethic. And that is a big leap. You are right, Annika. That is a big, a big leap. So now what would he give to his kids? Passion. Yes. Yes. Anyone who learns those instruments. It was not easy to pick up. You couldn't go down to a pawn shop and pick up a fiddle in those days. It was or an, have access to an organ or a piano. Um, so, yes. I mean, music. music and uh, respect and care for the great blessings we have. There you go. So, let's go down to his father, Adam. Now, Adam was not a migrating serf. He didn't work the land and pay rent. He did not uh, manage estates for others. But he did play music, and he was the court musician for a prince. And he played, let's see, piano, violin, cello, and guitar. Uh, he was, the um, I told you, the music director for a prince, and he was acquainted with Joseph Haydn and Hummel and Beethoven. He knew those three men personally and other musicians. Now, what did Adam now have to offer his 
child, his only child, Franz Liszt. The blessing of learning how to play instruments and the appreciation of blessings and hard work. I think you were right. I think you were right. So we can go back three generations and we know that Franz Liszt was given a lot just because he was born into that family. Now you, while we're talking about this, I want you to consider your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, and sometime try to collect information about them so they'll know what you, you will know what you have been blessed with. Now let's see what else he was blessed with. Okay. Because little Franz was their only child, they were very happy when he showed a great interest in music. Um, his father, Adam, started to teach him piano lessons when he was seven years old. He started to compose a little when he was eight years old, and when he was nine years old, he gave his first serious concerts. Um, he impressed the people around him, and they had wealthy friends who collected together and went to Adam List and said, we want to provide all the finances that you need to train your son in music. And we'll, we're even willing to pay for him to go abroad. In fact, Vienna, Austria was the center of music at the time, and they would pay for him to live and be taught in Austria. Well, Adam List was excited. He and his wife, he went and got a one-year leave of absence from the prince and moved the family to Austria, where he was taught by Carl Cherney. Now, you piano players, have you ever played, do you know anything about Carl Cherney? No. Ask, no. Your, ask your teachers a little bit about that. Do any of you play Hannon, the Hannon exercises? When our kids finished with the Hannon exercises, they were put into exercises written by Carl Cherney. That was his big claim to fame, is uh, exercises for the fingers. He was also very careful with the metronome. And it's very clear in Liszt's playing that, that Liszt played with a very steady beat, and that was probably because his teacher um, emphasized steady beat and playing with the metronome so much. He, his uh, composition teacher was the music director of... Um, Let's see, the Vienna, Viennese court. And so he learned from the very best teachers. He was acquainted with Beethoven. He wasn't a student of Beethoven, but he was acquainted with him. When the year was over, they wanted to stay longer. So Adam, uh, remind me of that, Sabrina. Thank you. Um, Adam went to his, the prince and said, I would like more time off. My son's doing well in Vienna. We'd like to stay in Austria a little bit longer. The prince said no. Adam, what do you think Adam List might have done? He quit. That was a big deal back then, like it would be today. He quit, and the whole family moved permanently to Vienna, Austria. Now, young Franz was a child prodigy. What, do I, what you see is a picture of a little... Um, oriental boy who is a child prodigy today. The other is a, a drawing, a sketching of young Franz. And I want you to listen to a little girl play uh, Liebestrom, which is a, one of the more famous pieces of Franz Liszt. Song of Love. Now, when Franz was a little boy, he was ridiculously good at the piano. His little hands couldn't always play those big chords. And so this is kind of, you know what a foreshadow is? This was probably a foreshadow of how he would perform later. But when he was missing a note, 
he would put his nose on the piano and play it with his nose uh, when he was just a little boy. We'll see how that might be a foreshadow of how he behaved later on the piano. He was trilingual. He knew French and German and Italian. He wasn't very good at his own native language in Hungary, Hungarian, and that always embarrassed him, but not enough for him to pay a lot of attention because he no longer lived in Hungary. And we can continue to listen to that for just a little. Oops, how did we do that? Not letting me have this back. <laughs> She's pretty good. Another great opportunity that Liszt had that others might not have had was his, his opportunity to meet and be taught by great people. He actually knew Victor Hugo, who wrote Les Miserables and um, what, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, um, The Toilers of the Sea. He also knew Heinrich Heine and several other German authors and they gave him books and he he always kind of felt bad about his education a little because his grand great grandfather was a serf and his grandfather managed estates and his father was a musician and none of them had been really well educated and they were kind of in charge of his education he did well with music but he was kind of left out in some of these other areas of education but because of his acquaintances with these great authors and thinkers and politicians and philosophers. Before he died, he had collected several thousand books and he had read them, which is no small thing when you think he lived during the pioneer era where people may have the Bible and you know one or two other books, but to, to accumulate, you'd be like Thomas Jefferson in accumulating several thousand. He also was able to not just know about this violin wizard, Paganini, he was able to attend a concert and sit in the rows and watch him play. And Paganini was probably the most technically advanced violinist of his day, and many of the techniques that he developed are taught to our students today. And uh, Liszt was able to actually be in the same room and watch him play. And we'll find out what impact that had on him little, in just a little bit. So now we could go back and see what Franz Liszt was given because he was Franz Liszt, his family. Great teachers and mentors. The gift of being a prodigy, of coming into this world with a natural talent for piano. And the opportunity to meet wonderful people intelligent people who had had accomplished much he was able to he couldn't buy a cd or get a kindle he actually was right there with them which is quite an opportunity so what did he do with all these great opportunities well we'll find out that he didn't just waste them he worked hard and he chose uh had many right choices and life hit him now he's 16 years old and his father dies. And you know, we've talked a little bit about his father and his family and how wonderful that, how, how, what a wonderful blessing that was in his life. But now the provider is gone. And he, little Franz, has been off touring and having a wonderful time. Now he's responsible to take care of his mother as the provider and the support of the family. He's an only child. And what would he do? Well, he gave up touring is what he did. He moved his mother to a small apartment, he and his mother to a small apartment in Paris, France, and he taught piano lessons and composition lessons. And he didn't have them come to his house. He went to their house. So he would leave early in the morning before light and walk all over Paris to give piano lessons from morning to night, six days a week, because his students were scattered all over the city. Now, um... While he, while he, this, during this time that he was teaching piano lessons, 16, 17, he fell in love with one of his students whose father disapproved and broke off the relationship. And as a result of this heartbreak and working too hard from morning till night with not much rest and the stress of supporting a family at such a tender age, he got very sick. 
very sick. Now he was already famous because he was a child prodigy and he had lived a life in aristocratic circles and he was very well known. He was so sick that one of the Paris newspapers wanted to get a jump, a journalistic jump on the other newspapers and printed an obituary for him. Well, of course, Franz Liszt didn't die. Uh, he did get well, but he did start to wonder about a musical career. He decided that it wasn't for him. And for one year, he didn't touch a piano. He was depressed. Um, he was uh, confused. He thought for a little while about going into the religious orders of the church, becoming a monk. Um, his mother asked him not to do that. She, she knew he had music in his bones and she didn't want him to do that, so he didn't. But he was still confused. And it was at this time, during this year when, sorry, everything looked the darkest. That's when he met Victor Hugo. And instead of saying, I'm depressed, I don't want to talk about it, that's when he started to take books and read, and read and read and educate himself. He wasn't spending time on the piano at this time. He was reading books. It was during this time that he went to that Paganini concert and watched him play. And interestingly enough, the concert he attended was a benefit concert. They'd had a cholera epidemic in Paris, and many people had, been, had died, um, and had, uh, a lot of families had been affected negatively by this terrible cholera epidemic. And so Paganini was playing this concert, and all of the ticket sales went to support these people who had been hurt by this cholera epidemic. And so those two things impacted Franz Liszt. For one thing, he said, if I ever go back to the piano, I'm, I, I will not go back unless I can become as good on the piano, as technically perfect on the piano, as Paganini is on a violin. This idea of a benefit concert, he tucked away. And we'll see if uh, he, oh, let's see, how do I move that? You're awfully handsome, Rodney. <laughs> there we go. Um, he tucked away the idea of benefit concerts away in his mind and heart for a little bit later. Now, also during this time, or shortly thereafter, after he did decide to go back to the piano, he met Ignace Bosendorfer. And he was a young adult in his 20s. He was one of 150 self-employed piano makers um, in Vienna. Vienna, was, they had lots and lots of piano players. Now, Ignace Bosendorfer, one of the things he wanted to do was to build pianos to suit the pianist. And when he befriended, he and Franz Liszt became friends. Franz Liszt um, was such a powerful piano player that he wore pianos right out. They were made of wood, and he would just beat them to pieces. And so Bosendorfer made a frame out of something other than wood, metal, and made it heavy duty and much, more, much stronger. Now, their pianos already had an unusually beautiful sound. And when they kind of bulked up the piano, it only made it better. It didn't hurt it at all. So they became friends for life. And Liszt liked playing on Bosendorfer pianos. Um, because they lasted. It was, felt like he was playing something more solid than something that was ready to fall apart. It also had, uh, there are actually some Bosendorfer pianos that have extra keys in the bottom, three or four extra keys on the bottom, but the bass sound is particularly resonant and beautiful on a Bosendorfer piano. So for the next eight years, Liszt played a thousand concerts. Sometimes he played two or three a week, and that's when Listomania happened. Wherever he went, he had screaming crowds that followed him. Now we're going to watch a listen to a piano player that plays, and you'll be able to see why uh, he needed a tougher piano. This is Hungarian Rhapsody. Listen to the low notes.
Watch his face. Watch the way his body moves as he plays this song. Now, Paganini had a lot of body movement and expression and antics when he played his violin. And Liszt kind of said he copied his desire to entertain from Paganini. In fact, his expressions were so bizarre sometimes that the public mocked, the newspapers mocked him. But he didn't mind. Now, there were times though he would take someone else's music and add tremolos and chromatic scales and um, credenzas um, that weren't true to the composer of the music he was playing. Uh, he kind of carried that a little too far and in a letter in 1837 he promised he would stop doing that, that he would be true that he wouldn't play fast and loud and trilly in Mozart's Moonlight Sonata, for example. And he wouldn't go from presto to largo, changing the tempos ridiculously. Now, there are some people who are not sure that he kept that promise. He wasn't quite as bizarre as before. But here is one newspaper reporter that reported in uh, the eight, uh, 1840. Let's see, Liszt's performance com commenced with Handel's Fugony Minor, which was played by Liszt with the avoidance of everything approaching the matriculous ornament, and indeed scarcely any additions except a multitude of ingeniously contrived and appropriate harmonies casting a glow of cover, color over the beauties of the composition and infusing into it a spirit from which no other hand had, it had ever received. So he wasn't quite, oh look, look at him. This boy heard this piece when he was two years old, and all he wanted to do was to play Liszt. And when I watch him play, I think he must have known that Liszt was an entertainer too. Um, he said he acted like this on the piano because he wanted to entertain an audience. And I think uh, this fellow likes to do the same thing. Beautiful song he's got here. He made two great changes. For one thing, he's the first one who ever had a solo concert. One piano and one musician. Never happened before. Uh, he, there, the piano had always been in the background of the stage. It was never an important instrument. Liszt made it an important instrument. And made it so that one, one musician could entertain an audience all over Europe for the whole evening. He also moved the piano to the center stage and turned it around so that the soundboard pushed the sound out into the audience and they could watch his hands, which they considered acrobats. And when we uh, watch uh, one of his etudes, we'll see the hands that were really acrobats. In fact, in this Hungarian Rhapsody, there's a little bit of acrobatic stuff in it too. Pretty sweet, isn't it? Oh, I hate to turn it off. I can't. Can you see Bugs Bunny? This is part of the Bugs Bunny cartoon. That little mouse. I can't remember his name. Colin J. Is that what it is? I don't know. Could be.
Now, if Liszt wanted someone to learn to play a piece like this, he was going to have to train their hands and every finger. a tough piano. for me to stop it because I want you to see I want you to see this is one of the most difficult pieces that uh, List ever wrote and watch this uh, artist this musician as he plays it La Campanella He's jumping around this is the acrobat the hand acrobatics that List was famous for In the middle of this, uh, whoops, I need to go back to here. Franz Liszt quit performing. At the height of his career, after playing a thousand concerts and developing Listomania and becoming a very wealthy man, he quit performing. And the reason he did that is at the bequest of his sweetheart who wanted him to compose and didn't want him distracted. So, for the next years, he composed a thousand pieces. For eight years, he played a thousand concerts, and now he composed a thousand pieces. Some of these were transcendental etudes. Now, we talked about what an etude is. It's a, a musical piece that is especially geared to improve technique. Now, they, his were called transcendental etudes. Well, you know, Walt Whitman and Thoreau wrote transcendental, they thought transcendental thoughts, and they wrote transcendental poetry, and it means it, it transcends human thought, that it's kind of heavenly or, well, transcendental etudes of Liszt were not because they were out of this world or above human thought. It's because they were above a human's ability to play them. In fact, Schumann said that only 10 or 12 people in the world could play these transcendental etudes. Um, of those thousand pieces, Liszt could play all thousand of them, including the etudes. 
I want you to watch. Here is a Russian playing the Chopin etude. Let's see if I can go back. I'll show you what it is that he's going to play. Here's this little one with the 16th notes. So look at that music, and then I'm going to start uh, the recording, and you're going to see this fellow play the Chopin etude. Notice the piano is in the center of the stage, the soundboard is out to the audience, and he's going to play an etude for that whole audience. This is Chopin's etude. Okay, do you think he's got those 16th notes down? That's what Chopin wanted him to do. Now let's go to the same pianist playing a transcendental etude, and this is what the music looks like. What a contrast, huh? That's a regular etude that sounds brilliant, but this is what lists etude looks like. Now let's listen to it and watch his hands. marvelous playing the piano before you could even start learning this. I do appreciate all your comments. So there we go. That's what he was writing. Now, the other thing he wrote was tone poems. If you look right here, he wrote tone poems. First one to write tone poems. And a tone poem is a long orchestral piece that is, is uh, written to represent something that's not musical, like uh, an event in history or a painting or a scene of nature or something like that. And so we're going to, just for a second, um, talk about a tone poem, one of the, his most famous tone poem called The Prelude, Les Preludes, The Preludes. And the order of this orchestral piece that's about 15 minutes long, first it asks a question, with the music it asks a question, then it has, as you can see, 50, 60 bars that represent love, and then a storm comes. 
And following the storm comes the longest part of the piece, which is a bucolic calm, which means an absolute calm. You can imagine a springtime scene on a farm where the sheep are out there, the animals are just laying or grazing, and it's total calm. And then comes the battle and victory. And I, I am going <laughs> to, we're going to skip talking about this right now. If we have time, we'll come back. But you, especially you older kids, I want you to read through the preface to this piece and listen to it and see if you can tell where the question ends and the love part begins and where the love part ends with a storm. And then the storm is over and it is beautiful, calm, absolute calm. And then when the calm is over and you've collected your thoughts, the battle begins and then you receive the victory. And you'll hear the recapitulation, meaning the music that comes in the beginning for the question comes again at the end of the victory. And so you've answered your question. Uh, if you go, I have it written here um, on the slide, and this slideshow is in your is in the module. That's how long the, pre the preface is that was written in the music in the front of the music. Here's the question, and we'll come back to it if we can. The storm, the bucolic calm, and the battle and victory. But I want, I want to talk before we end on after all the things Franz Liszt was given and all the work he put in and all the right choices he made, now he has the chance to keep it all or give what he's got. And I'm telling you, Franz Liszt gave. One thing, he transcribed, um, I don't know, do you know what transcribe means? Anybody got an idea of what to transcribe music means? means like they're just telling him the notes and he writes it for them. Well, you know, you might that that that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Um, but in this case, to transcribe means here is a man, Hector Berloitz. He's not really well known, and he has written this fantastic piece of music. Let's see, right here. Called this is the March to the Scaffold is the fourth movement, and you might recognize this. Uh, your, your little brothers and sisters might if they're doing family school because they, they had to memorize the name of this piece. Now, here's Leonard Bernstein conducting. Berloitz was not a famous musician, not a famous composer, and yet he wrote a piece like this and many others, and how are they going to get out? You can't put them on CD. You can't put them on the radio. What was he to do? Here's the famous part. Okay, now let's go back. I'll tell you what he did. He made friends with Franz Liszt. And Franz Liszt took his own time and his money to not only publish this great symphony, the Symphony Fantastic, but he transcribed it into a piano solo. So he could play it for friends and friends could learn it and play it for their friends so they could hear... Is this being recorded? Yes, it is. I hope. Okay. I tried to make it recorded. I hope it is. Anyway, he could get the sound of the symphony out there so people would hear it and learn to love it. Now, he did that with quite a few struggling um, composers. That's what he spent his time, and he spent his own money publishing this piece. Now, he wrote essays... Because up until this time, maybe you remember when we talked about Baroque composers, they were like journalists. They were given an assignment and they wrote a piece of music. They did it for Sunday services or for the coronation of a king. Here's a famous part. Ah, oh, such a beautiful piece of music. I'm so glad it wasn't lost. He wanted people to look at musicians as musicians, as respected members of the community, not servants. And so he wrote essays, just slowly trying to change the public sentiment about music. Now, Beethoven, you remember he met Beethoven when he was a small boy and Beethoven was in his later years. They were building a monument in Bonn, Germany to Beethoven and they ran out of money. And so the whole project was going up in smoke. So he went and he pledged financial support to build the monument you're looking at right now in Bonn, Germany. 
he also, and I need to show you this, he also took, here is Beethoven's uh, Ninth Symphony. Let's see if you've recognized this. Oh shoot, I don't want you to listen to this yet. This is his transcription. I want you to hear the symphony so you can hear how similar it is. Here we go. Have you heard this? Now, Beethoven was famous. He didn't need any money, he was already dead. And his music was out there for the aristocrats. They could pay to go to his hero symphony play this song. But Liszt wanted everyone to love this song and many other beautiful songs. Ah. So this is what he did to him. He turned him into piano music. Not so hard, but what you and I could maybe learn how to play it. This is the best he could do without CDs or digital music. Now, he didn't make a lot of money doing this, but he didn't need a lot of money. He didn't need to, he didn't need to do anything for himself anymore. In fact, when he was so, gee, I can't remember, nearly 50, maybe? He decided, enough already. I've had enough money. I don't need any more. Every time I perform in a concert, all the ticket sales, I'm giving away to charity. And when you hear this piano piece, you can bring it all back. <clears throat> you can see the conductor, you can see the instruments, and love, <coughs> love that piece all over again. Here's where Liszt's money went. It went to support schools, music schools. The gymnasium is like a high school. So he built high schools or helped construct high schools. He built churches and cathedrals. <clears throat> he contributed to the musician's pension fund, which was to take care of older musicians who were not no longer in their prime and weren't earning money. He donated to hospitals and schools. He home donated to prisons and orphanages. And he went back to giving concerts for a while because there was a great fire in Hamburg. Many people were left homeless and he contributed all of the money to those homeless uh, victims of that great fire. And I can't, you know, I, I can't do, according to family school rules, I can't go less than 24 pitch in these, these uh, PowerPoint presentations or I could have put a lot more uh, charities that he contributed to. So let me ask you, what have you been given? And when life hits you right in the face, how will you respond? Remember the first thing that happened in List's life when he was old enough to take on life was the death of his father. No small thing for that boy and no brothers and sisters to help. And so in your prayer, Emmeline, you wanted to know what, you wanted Heavenly Father to help us know what to give and help us respond to life in a similar way to Franz Liszt, perhaps. And certainly we have a list of things as long as he has for what we've been given just for being born onto this earth. You like this part? Oh, Beethoven, Beethoven, Beethoven. Now, for just a minute, let's go back to that tone poem. Because this is going to take some thought. Here's the question. Now, you know what I'm talking about, right? This is the tone poem. The question, the love, the storm, bucolic calm, and the battle and the victory. Um, this is kind of the way List's life was. 
I wonder what the question is, because certainly love comes first as children and youth. Then the storm comes, the kind of hurt, and we grow and change and mature. And when some of the storms are over, we have a calm time to think it through. And when we've thought it through and we regroup as a stronger, more mature person, then comes the battle. Now, I wonder what the question is. This to me is amazing because remember, the gospel is on the earth when List is on the earth, but not where he is. But look at this question. What do you think about that question? What is our life but a series of preludes to that unknown hymn, the first and solemn note of which is intoned by death? What else is our life but a series of preludes to that unknown hymn, and the first note of that unknown hymn is death? Anybody got any ideas? This is going to stretch your brains, my young people. I'm going to help you with uh, it. This, it is the noon of our eternities. Okay, explain that. Explain a little more about that, Sabrina, and all your siblings. <laughs> what is a prelude? What is a prelude? That's up uh, a figure. What is it? I'm. I said a setup to a figure piece. Yes, it's yes, it's what happens before. That's right. It's a setup. It's the introduction. So our life is an introduction then to what? In this phrase, it says our life is an introduction to the unknown. An unknown him. Okay, now don't look at the quote anymore. Just look at just look at me. What is our life a prelude to in the gospel? As far as the plan of happiness, our life is a prelude to becoming like our Father in heaven. Yes, and that happens in the next life, right? And when does that next life start? And it says it in this in this uh, question. When we die. When we die. Well, what does List know about the gospel without having heard the discussions? What else is our life? It's not worth anything except a prelude to the next life. And how does our life unfold? Just like this. We're loved, we're given, we're... You can't, you can't, oh boy. Uh, we're loved and then we're given challenges and then we're given time to think through those challenges and become something like Franz Liszt became something. And then whatever battle life throws at us, some of it arranged by heaven, some of it by just being mortal, we win because we've been prepared. We've been through the storm. We've had time to think and then off we go. And then we're prepared for that unknown hymn that's first known, first note, whoops, wrong way, is intoned by death. Isn't that beautiful? So I want you to uh, listen to, listen to the song. Um, it's in the module. You can get the link in the module. It's only 15 minutes long. You can see how many measures are in each section, so you can kind of get an idea of when it, it should change, and you can hear that it changes, and then hear the recapitulation at the end. And uh, let's see, your homework assignment is an essay. Let's see. The, for the middle school, it's an essay. For the advanced 
it's an it's a paraphrase of this preface this preface and I want you to do it exactly like the instructions say I want you to line it up in two columns and write idea for idea not word for word I want idea for idea so that I know when you're done I know you understand what this preface is about any questions on that homework the younger ones can do an essay on when you've furthered your own education taken advantage of opportunities that come sometimes at difficult times kind of like Franz Liszt did he had a year of real depression um, lost he lost his father he worked too hard his he fell in love and that didn't work out and then got sick and then went to a year of depression and it, during that time he had all the educational opportunities he'd never had before but he took advantage of them which is unlike some people who just won't even because it's a hard time so any questions on the assignments okay I look forward to seeing your work uh, I do want you to do this work and as many of you who want to paraphrase this I would love to see it because I know your brain will be exercised it will be a real uh, calisthenics for your brain to look at these big ideas it's just poetry uh, Franz Liszt was a poet he wasn't just a musician he was a really it was a poet and this is evidence of it right here just this little preface so great I hope you love Franz Liszt as much as I do um, I sure do, I sure do love him, and I'm sorry if I didn't get the camera, I'm like, oh my goodness, the camera is off. Well, it didn't hurt you all that much. <laughs> so, let's see, Sabrina, did you say that someone in your family would like to give the closing prayer? <laughs> Who it was? Let's see. Yes. Andrew oh. wanted to. Andrew. Okay. Yes. Hi, Rodney. <laughs> okay, Andrew, go ahead and uh, give it's us a closing prayer. Hi, guys. Yes. It is time for the prayer. Hey. Okay. Just say the prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for saying thank you for the great nation. Thank you that we could have um, come to Class Connect or whatever it is. What is in? Okay. Um, and we are supposed to set a, a good day today and a good day tomorrow and that we'll all have fun and I say these things and you just curse them in. Amen. Amen. Right. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Now I've got my camera back on so you can see that I'm really here. And we'll see you then next week. We'll talk about Camille Sassons, a French composer who had... Uh, quite a different life than Franz Liszt. So we'll see you, and you're welcome. <laughs> bye bye, Sabrina and family, and thank you, Andrew. You're welcome, Benjamin. You are welcome. Oh, you guys are awesome. I don't have time to read all these chats. Oh. Ha <laughs> ha
I've been in a concert where a piano string has broken in the middle of a performance. Oh, you guys are awesome. I'm at the bottom see if there's any more. I am reading chats right now. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm doing, and I am very much enjoying it. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Love you all. Bye-bye.